Well, for those of you I do not know, my name is Marlon Longacre, and I'm one of the pastors here at Piedmont Church. I'm the community pastor. And if you have your Bibles this morning, what I'd love for you to do is go ahead and turn with me to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, we're going to start with verse 17. But usually at the end of the month, I, I get to come up and do the giving talk, and I get to share what like Karen just did, and I always share what all the projects in which we have done in the community. And I want to thank you for your support of Love Does. We've had a busy month, and I've shared this with you many times before. You gave through one of the hardest periods of times in our nation's history. And Piedmont Church continued to meet the deepest needs in our community. And here, here we are all these years later. The fruits of that have been unbelievable. The opportunities and the doors have opened us for us in so many new ways. And this past month, we have been extremely busy. October has been a very busy month for us in showing God's love to the community. Our first project we did is we cooked for the Sheriff's Department. And we had that way in advance before the two officers were killed. We were already ministering to him, had that on the calendar. We fed those uh, Sheriff's Departments over there around the County Farm Road. And then we, we came back, we, we cooked the very next day for J.J. Daniel Middle School teachers. That was a great project there. And then we, we cooked hot dogs for Blackwell Elementary's Fall Festival. And then on uh, the following week, we were at uh, Osborne High School partnering with the police department for Faith in Blue, where we fed all the after school, all the activities that were going on at Osborne High School, helping the police officers build relationships with them. It's been a busy month. We, this past Friday night, we fed the, the South Cobb football team. They were 0-7, and, and, they, and, and they, needed, they didn't have anybody to cover their pregame meal, and, and the, the chaplain called Piedmont and said, Marlon, can Piedmont help us out? I said, sure. He said, you want to come and talk? I said, no, you got that. You do a good job with it. I believe in you. Piedmont wants to support you and your ministry. And then we fed the Sprayberry JV football teams twice with, with, with those projects. Folks, it is amazing the countless number of ways in which you have shown God's love. This past Tuesday, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in the message, we took our first 100 bags of Love Does groceries 4.5 miles from here to Sawyer Road Elementary. The next 150 bags will be going to Bells Ferry, Blackwell Elementary, and Chalker Elementary. Many of you may or may not know, but Chalker Elementary is the school that has the most kids who come from uh, weekly rental hotels. Over six weekly rental hotels feed their schools. So we're going to be taking bags to help them with, with that project. I say all that because I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the way that you serve. Thank you for the way that you give. And I just, you know, you leave me out there in the community, and Angie and I are just so grateful for that. So I wanted to say thank you. Well, I want to start off today by looking at one of the most controversial and misunderstood passages in the book of James. Every cult misunderstands it, and they try to use this passage to prove that you have to work your way into heaven. James 2.17 reads this, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. Now, the entire New Testament preaches or, and teaches that we are saved by faith alone. Ephesians 2.8 reads, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Now, James comes along and he says it's not just faith, but faith and works. Now, what's he talking about here? You see, both James and Paul are right, but they're talking about two different things here. Paul was fighting the problem of legalism. You know, the problem, I've got to keep all the Jewish laws, the rituals, in order to be a Christian. James is not fighting legalism. He's fighting laxity, not being strict or careful enough about work, work rules or standards of behavior. He's talking about showing that you're a Christian. He's talking about the behavior of a Christian. They were fighting different enemies, but they both use the word works. And they do it in different ways. When Paul uses the word works, he's talking about Jewish laws like circumcision and things like that. When James uses it, he's talking about the lifestyle of a Christian. The acts of love. Love does. Paul focuses on the root of salvation, what happens to us on the inside. James is talking about the fruit of salvation, what we do on the outside. Paul's talking about how to become a Christian. James is talking about how to behave like a Christian. 
Paul's talking about how to know that you're a Christian. James is talking about how to show that you're a Christian. Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 reads this. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith for a life of good works that God has prepared in advance. Now look at these three prepositions here. By grace, through faith, for good works. Now you got to keep them in order or you will run into trouble here. Example, if you think you're saved by works for faith, you're in deep trouble. He is saying we are saved by grace, through faith, to do great things. We are saved by just accepting God's gift. So how do I show that I'm a Christian? How do I behave like a Christian? James gives us five examples in this passage today to let people know that you have the real thing, okay? Here's number one. Real faith is not just something you say. Look at James 2.14. What good is it, my brother, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? Now notice it, it does not say he actually has faith. He just claims to have it. He talks about it. He talks a good game. He knows all the right things to say. He's been to the latest conferences and seminars. And you, you see them. Uh, they, they can quote all the greatest theories going on by some of the great people in our country. They can quote all that. But you never see a picture of them doing anything. Let me put it to you like this, okay? As your community pastor. Our goal at Piedmont Church with community ministries is to always be the first call for help in our community. I got that when I worked at Life of Georgia. We were at a United Way meeting, and I remember the United Way director says, we want United Way to be the, the first call for help. And then God just like hit me in the back of the head. Like, and the only time I ever felt like that was one time when I didn't stand quick enough for a veteran, and my dad whopped me upside the head. Same feeling, man. He said, you stand for a veteran, boy. And then our second goal, when we do Love Does is we want to meet the deepest needs of our community. Now, how do we do that? Well, we meet with the 365 people. That, that's what we call them. These are people who are on the front lines every single day that are in the mud. Your school social workers, your, your lead instructional teachers, you know, city managers, police, all these people we meet with and we listen to them and we say, tell us what you see. How can we help you? You see, this coming Thursday, right in our conference center, we will have a 112 local charities that are frontline ministries. They'll be meeting in our conference center. We have a luncheon here, and we're going to be listening to them. Say, tell us what you see to make sure that our Love Does projects are always up to date. But could you imagine if I listened to them and hear to all their needs? Or when a, when a person in the community calls us and asks for help, and we look at them and we go, well, we're praying for you. Good luck with that. I remember when I was uh, starting off my first day in ministry, January 13th, 1999. I remember it like it was yesterday. I went into Ackworth Elementary. At that time, Ackworth Elementary was dead last in reading and writing in the community. Dead last. And I met with their lead instructional teacher that morning. I sat down with her in her office. I made an appointment. I said, how can we work with you? How can we help with that? Because at the time, Ackworth was, they had 22% of their kids lived in, in the Ackworth Housing Authority. Another 16 to 17% lived in a weekly rental hotels and trailer court. They had a modern living mobile home trailer court. I said, how can we help you with that? And I'll never forget what she did to this day. It haunts me or motivates me, one of the two. She picks up a folder that was like this thick, puts it on the desk, and she says, I have sent letters out to so many churches asking for help, churches that have made us so many promises, and I never hear from them. Why are you any different? Well, the good news was we, we were a brand new church and our church was in a trailer in, a, in Trash Buster's parking lot. So she couldn't send us an email yet or a letter yet. Folks, listen, there are a lot of people who claim to be Christians 
millions and millions of people who will say, I'm a born again, but you don't see it in their lifestyle. I know a lot of young people, a lot of people who go out on Friday and Saturday night, they, you know, they, they, want, to sow, they, they want to sow their wild oats, and then come Sunday morning, they, they're, they're going to be praying for crop failure. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Real faith is not just something you say. Not everybody who's a professor of Christianity is a possessor of Christianity. I just want to say, I'm so grateful to you. And that's why I get up here and thank you for all the way that you support Love Does. Because Angie and I are out in the community every day. And I want to say thank you because of the way that you support Love Does and the way that you give to our church. We're just not empty words. Because this community knows that we're the first call for help. And the people that we partner with, they know we're going to meet their deepest needs. I've said to you many times, probably the greatest buzz in ministry is when we take the fresh supplies, the Love Does bags, and we deliver to those on the front lines. When we are their answered prayer, there's no buzz better. Real faith is not just something you say, it's not just something you feel. It's more than emotions. A lot of people confuse emotions and sentiments with faith. You can be emotionally moved but never act on it. I remember a, a Peanuts cartoon, you know, uh, Charles Schultz Peanuts cartoon, and, and they had this cartoon where, where uh, Charlie Brown and Linus were inside the house. I shared this on Epic on Friday. And they were in the house, and they were warm and toasty, feeling good, you know, comfortable. And they look out their window, and they see Snoopy out at the doghouse, freezing to death, in front of an empty food bowl. And they're like, oh, man, that, that's so sad that Snoopy's out there freezing to death. Don't you feel guilty? And they, 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 they open up the door, and, and they say, you know, we need to do something. They open up the door, and they look at Snoopy out at the, at the doghouse and say, hey, Snoopy, be of good cheer. The sun's going to come up tomorrow, you know, warm up then, you know. Charles Schultz got the idea for that comic strip from these two verses here. Look at James 15 and 16 with me. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? Real faith is more than just sympathy, feeling, and emotion. You get assistance. You do something about it. You act on it. You take the initiative. Many of you may or may not know that my father was a volunteer fireman for 35 years there at the Fairdale Volunteer Fire Department there in my hometown of Fairdale, Kentucky. For 15 of those years, my dad was chief. And my dad was the original acts of kindness guy. Park cars at all the fairs, work concession stands, made the corn dogs, drove the bus for the football team or, and the basketball team, my brother's basketball team. And I remember one day he was back in the, the fire truck into the bay. He had come from Fairdale Elementary doing a project there at the school. And I'm sitting there at the, the, the bay, the door waiting on him to come in. He gets off, he gets out of the truck and you know, I look at Dad and I say, Dad, why do you do all these things? And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, son, if all we ever did around this firehouse is wait for a house to catch on fire, we'll be standing around a lot. We're here to serve. My dad took the initiative. God took the initiative. We couldn't go to him, so Jesus came to us. And because Jesus came to us, we are to go to our community. So many of them can't come to us, so we go to them. We take the initiative, right? Our mission statement is our senior pastor, Dr. Ike Reichert's personal mission statement. We exist to show God's love in such a way 
that people would exchange ordinary living for an extraordinary life through the transforming power of Jesus Christ. We exist to show, not talk about it. We exist not to say, be of good cheer, but to do something, right? 1 John 3, 17 reads, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Real faith is generous. It wants to give. Folks, let me ask you something. Who can count on you in a crisis? John 3, 14 says, One of the proofs of salvation is that we love other Christians. The church that loves is the church that grows. And we exist to show God's love. Let me show you what that looks like. Many of you who get the epic email, experience in Piedmont in the community, I've told you for the last few weeks that the first 100 Love Does bags was going to go to Sawyer Road Elementary. Their school social worker called Angie in August to make sure that Piedmont was going to continue to do the Love Does grocery bags. So the first 100 went to Sawyer Road Elementary. Now, folks, we're talking about a school 4.5 miles maybe from our church here. Because others have backed out. So on Tuesday, we deliver the grocery bags over to the school. Angie took the first bag. I was at a lunch, and I came back. We loaded up our truck, and she loaded the rest of hers. We took them there. And all I saw was a crowded office there. And I'm thinking it must be early release date, something like that. But no, it wasn't. It was the families lining up to get the bags. And we didn't even put them in a storage unit there for Thanksgiving. We just put the bags around the front desk. And they had one of their volunteers, he had a list of the addresses of the, for, to put in the back of his van to deliver straight to the houses of those who didn't have cars. And as I'm carrying the bags in, people were carrying them out. And I looked at Angie as one of the families drove away and the, and that, the volunteer drove away. I thought, they're not going to wait till Thanksgiving. That may be Tuesday night, Danny. And I said, Angie, we haven't even bought the turkey money yet. Could you imagine if Angie, when that lady called, said, man, we, we, we hope you do well. You know, James lays it on the line in verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by actions, is dead. Look, if you don't feel like helping other Christians in need, you've got a dead faith. Folks, take the initiative today. Grab the loved us bag. Go over there and see Tony and, and, and grab one of the Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes to help those who are in need, not only here but around the world. It's not just something that you say. Real faith is not just something that you feel. Real faith is not just something you think. For some people, faith is something that must be studied, debated, talked about, you know, discussed. James imagines what that person looks like in verse 18. Look with me. Someone will say, you have faith, I have deed. You're into faith, I'm into works. Different strokes for different folks. Let's debate about it. Stimulate me mentally, but don't ask me to make any commitments here. So many people just want to talk. Have you ever noticed how when you're doing things and they want to slow you down, they, people just want to talk? I think of Nehemiah when he... He, he's building the, the, the wall, and he's just about completed. He's got about a couple more things to do. And all of a sudden, his enemies want to come and just have a discussion. And he goes, you know what? The time for talk is over. I'm carrying on a great project here. I don't have time to talk. You know, Libby and I, this past year, one of our goals for this year, because you know, Matthew has... We have a special needs son, Matthew. He's autistic. Many of you know that. You know, we had to get guardianship of him. And then, you know, Libby and I had to get our wills redone. You know, we, 
we had to redo our finances and, and to make sure that Matthew was taken care of. And, you know, we met with Jeff right here at our church, and he's helping us. And one of the things that he advises us to is to make sure that we have a balanced portfolio, that we, you know, not put all of our eggs in one basket. God has an investment portfolio for all of us. And I don't have time to go over all the funds that God wants us to invest in. But one of the funds is a, that James is talking to the group of people is, these are the people who are investing in the growth fund, right? Proverbs 10, 16 says, the earnings of the godly enhance their lives, but evil people squander their money on sin. Notice, wise people, godly people, use their money to make their lives better, to enhance their lives. Folks, God wants us to move on from elementary teachings. He wants us to mature. He wants us to grow. And I say that because he wants you to take your finances. He wants you to go to a seminar. He wants you to sign up for Ed's class. He wants you to take your funds there and invest in CDs, buy a Christian book. Anytime you do that, when you go to a conference, a marriage retreat, and you're investing in your growth, that is investing in God's growth fund. You've got to do that. That is investing in eternity. God wants you to do that. I need to do more of it. The problem is, is that we're not balanced, right? The world we live in today is impressed with knowledge. It's, it's how much you know. God's impressed with wisdom. It's what you do with what you know, right? There are other funds that God wants us to invest in. There's the mutual fund where you invest every time you use your resources to encourage fellowship. When we send a car, when we prepare a meal for someone who's in need, when we open our home up for a Bible study, that's investing in God's growth fund. That's investing in eternity. There's also a service fund. God wants us to use our resource to help people who are in need. That's what love does is all about. You know, the Bible calls love does or service giving, meeting, needs in Jesus name and anytime you use your resources to help those who are down you help them with their their spiritual problems their physical problems and all those things you are investing in God's service fund now there are many definitions of knowledge in the New Testament and one of them is where we get the Greek word gnosko it means working experience experiential knowledge it's when you take what you know and apply it it doesn't become theory, it becomes way of life. And you become more passionate about it because what you know and what you think, and when you apply it and you see that it works, you become more passionate about it. That's why I'm so passionate about what we do in the community because I see the difference. I get to see it every day, the impact that our church makes when we show God's love in so many ways. Now there's another definition of knowledge in the Bible. It's where we get the word oida and that's pronounced, it's spelled O-I-D-A. It means factual content. It means truth. It means information that we have in our mind. Daniel talked about that last week when he talked about truth. He, he said up here, he said, I want to talk to you truth today, that you are saved to serve, that you're created to serve, that serving makes your life meaningful. You are called to serve. All that is truth that you need to know in your head. But when you take that what you know in your head and you let the Holy Spirit guide you and you apply it in your life, it becomes gnosko knowledge. Now, folks, listen to me. I, I could stand up here for weeks and line up people to come up here with testimony after testimony to share how you're giving to the growth fund and the service funds and all the funds here at this church makes an impact on their life and the people that they serve. We have what we call a Love Does 365 conference. We do that about every quarter here in the conference center where we bring all the people that we serve in and they come and share and we let you see the difference and the impacts that you're making. And this past year, we had a student from Kennesaw State come in and share. Many of you remember last December, part of the Love Does projects is we helped the homeless students at KSU, we helped purchase some of their meal plans for them to have something to eat. Now this student is at the school, was raised in foster care. Her and her sibling were abandoned in a hotel. 
They've grown up in foster care. They've aged out. They have no home. And she shared. And real people touch real people. She's not polished. She got up and she shared this. The first thing she said off the bat was, goes, I want to thank Piedmont Church because you're the first group that actually asked us what we need. Then I want to thank you because you have no idea what it means to me to go to school knowing that I have something to eat every day. Thank you. Real faith produces change. It's not something you say, feel, or think. Real faith is not just something you believe. Look at verse 19. You believe that there's one God, good. Even the devils believe that and shudder. There are so many who have strong beliefs in God, the Bible and Jesus, so many who know scriptures, they can recite creeds, they, they talk about the doctrines of the Trinity. I mean, they know scriptures like the back of their hand. And James looks at them and says, big whoop. Just saying I believe in God is not good enough to get you into heaven. Even the devil believes that. Psalms 14.1 reads, the fool has said in his heart, but there is no God. It's foolish to be an atheist, and the devil's no fool. He believes in God. He knows a lot more of the Bible than we do. He knows theology uh, backwards and forward. He's been around a whole lot longer than us. But notice it says his demons believe and shudder. The Greek word for that is to bristle. Their hair stands up on end. Why? Because they understand the majesty and the awesomeness of God. And that word believe there in Greek, it means to trust into, to cling to, to rely on, to commit yourself to. I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. It's more than just head knowledge. A lot of people have it in their head, and they're going to miss heaven by 18 inches because they need it in their heart. Like that country music song by Tracy Lawrence. You know, I've got it in my head. I just got to break it through my heart, right? Folks, there's many people in Cobb County who say that, hey, I believe in God. Many, Cherokee, many will say that. And then you go up to them and you say, well, do you attend church? No. Are you in a Bible study? No. Do you give? Do you tithe? No. Do you use your skills and the talents that God gives you, your resources to benefit others? No. Do you truly want to do God's will? Are you in his word? No. And James would look at that person and say, really? Are you a believer? Really? Really? Real faith is not something you say, think, feel, or believe. Real faith is something that you do. And whenever I hear that word do, it reminds me of an experience that I had in my life. Anytime I hear do, you know, I shared with you a few weeks ago about shape and how we have, all of us have a spiritual gifts, heartbeats, abilities, different personalities. We have experiences where we have relational experiences, spiritual experiences, vocational experiences. We all have different experiences in which we see the world through. Well, let me share with you a spiritual experience that I had. I was on a mission trip in Slovakia, and we were with a group of kids in a bus on our way to Auschwitz. And we had been there for about two or three days. We were we were there to do projects at the schools. We were there to help remodel some of their classrooms. And I, I got to speak uh, English to a group of kids who speak absolute perfect English. So you knew I butchered that one real bad. That didn't go real well. <laughs> they speak perfect English. So you throw slang in there, they just look at you like. But we were... While we were remodeling their classrooms, it was amazing looking out at, at the, their courtyard, the group of kids that were just gathering to watch us. And even uh, the next few mission trips that followed up after we did, we were the first to go to this area. They would have big crowds 
gather to watch them put in like playgrounds down at the park. But we had big crowds come and watch us. And then while we were on the bus on our way to Auschwitz, they couldn't get away, from, uh, they couldn't wait to get away from their, their teachers or their instructors and everything because they wanted to get us alone. You could just tell. And so they finally got away. We were on the bus. We were on our way to Auschwitz. And they said, gather, they gathered us around and said, we just want to ask y'all a quick question real quick. I'm like, sure. They go, this is what they said. They asked us, what do Christians do? We see you go into the building, but you don't come out. Haunts me to this day. I want you to look at verse 20. James gives us two opposite examples of people whose faith led them to be doers. Their faith in God led them to take action. Abraham and Rahab. First service, I said rehab. Oh, that was embarrassing. It was embarrassing. And don't think I won't hear about it all week for Mike, you know. Abraham's a man. Rahab's a woman. Abraham's Jewish. Rahab is Gentile. Abraham's a patriarch. Rahab's a prostitute. Abraham is somebody. Rahab's a nobody. You know, Abraham's a primetime player. Rahab is someone who comes off the bench. And what I love about this, and my, you know, I'm not James, but I can only imagine he's, he's taking these two as so extreme to show all of us here that, that all of us here, no matter what background, no matter how much funds you have, no matter what sins you've committed, all of us here, no matter what, it we're all by grace, through faith, we are saved to do great works. All of us. Look at verse 20. You foolish men, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when offered his son Isaac on the altar? His faith and his actions were working together. His faith was made complete by what he did. Scripture was fulfilled when it said Abraham believed God. Folks, Abraham stepped out. He was the man here in Cobb County in Turkey. He was the man. He was the top dog. He's 75 years old. God comes down to him and says, Abraham, I need you to leave. I need you to step out in faith because I've got something better for you. I want to make you a father of a great nation. So for the next 25 years, he lives in tents. He stepped out. Then he has success. He has a, a child, Isaac, at 99, him and Sarah. Isaac means laughter. Wouldn't you be laughing too if you were 99 years old being a father? Right? <laughs> Me, you know. But then God, when he has success and has the baby, God says, I need you to sacrifice. Folks, anytime you have success, God's going to ask you to sacrifice. He said, I want you to sacrifice your son. Abraham's already a believer. He goes and gathers the wood, builds the altar, walks with his son up there. He is already believing. He says, son, we will return. He lays him down. He's getting ready to sacrifice. And God says, no, that, we're good. Stop. I just want to see what matters in your life you'd be obedient to me. Rahab, her story's in verse 25. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did, saved, when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in different directions. You can find Rahab's story in Joshua's too. She's a prostitute. She helps two spies when they were coming to Jericho. She ends up in the family line of Jesus. She risked her life to save two spies. Folks, listen to me. Our faith is not determined by what we do. It's demonstrated by what we do. 
Let me close with this story, okay? There was a tightrope walker. Say that five times, would you? George Blondin, about 70 to 80 years ago. He was a, a tightrope walker, and he was going to, he gets on a tightrope, and he walks from Niagara Falls all the way to the Canada side. So he gets there and he walks across gigantic crowds to see this. He makes it to the Canada side and everybody's just cheering. Ah, that's great, awesome. Then he, he holds up his hand. And then he walks back. Then he goes back again. Does it about five or six times. And then on the, the next time that he comes back to the to the American side, he, he grabs a wheelbarrow and he fills it with dirt and he puts it on the tight rope and he, he walks across, makes it, walks back. He does that about five or six times. The crowd's going crazy, the fans who are there. And one of the fans goes up to him and says, says man, you're awesome. I think you could do that all day if you want to. He goes, really? He goes, you think I could do this all day? He goes, yeah. He says, I, I think you could do it all day. And here's what George did. He takes the wheelbarrow and he dumps the dirt out. And he says, get in the wheelbarrow. Some of you here today need to listen to Karen, what she said. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me, some of you are in here today are banking eternity on whether Jesus Christ is telling the truth or he's a liar. You need to get in a wheelbarrow. Some of you truly believe that this church was created to serve this community. This church was here in 1962 for 60 years. I can tell you as your community pastor, no community looks at a church more than this one. Some of you believe that. You need to get in a wheelbarrow. Some of you believe that, that, that you know, God has a plan and a purpose for his life and, and that God's will is found in God's word. Can I tell you something? You need to get in a wheelbarrow. You need to get in a Bible study. Because God's will is found in God's word. You need to get in it. God put this church here to never look at this community and say, be of good cheer. Hang in there. The message of this church is the word propitiation. It means Jesus paid the full price for our sin. He lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death, arose three days later. And folks, listen to me. The way that we validate that message is the way that we go out and we serve like Jesus did. In the countless number of ways in which we show God's love. That's what we do. At Piedmont Church, all of us here, For it is by grace, through faith, we have been saved to do great things, which God prepared in advance. We've all been saved to be unleashed, to show his love in appreciation for what he has done for us, for the price that he paid on that cross. That's the way we validate the message. Amen. Would you stand with me and pray? Some of you in here today need to get in that wheelbarrow. You need to come to grips right now that Jesus Christ is telling the truth, that he is the way. There's no other ways, one way, Jesus. 
And if you want to accept him as your Lord and Savior today, you want to get that out of the way and you want to get in the wheelbarrow, you just simply say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Save me. I believe you came for me. I believe you lived for me. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose for me. Lord Jesus, come into my life and be my personal Lord and Savior. Some of you in here today need to get in the wheelbarrow, know that you need to be in a Bible study. Lord, today I pray that they will get with Daniel to find a group to be with. So many people here today, Lord, I know that you have saved them to serve. They're ready to put that, what they know to be true and apply it into their lives. They're ready to go to Gnosko knowledge. I pray, Lord, that they come down here today to seek your face and your guidance on the next steps for that. That they seek the Holy Spirit, Lord, to guide them in the next step for that. And Father, maybe they need to come down and pray for our church as we continue to go forth into this community and show your love in so many ways so the people out there in this community will make that great exchange from ordinary to extraordinary through the transforming power of Jesus Christ. That's my prayer today. For it's in Jesus Christ's name that I pray, amen.